Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this virtual live community meeting on Wheatley. Participants may submit questions in the comments section. While we try to answer as many questions as we can, but based on time parameters, not all questions will be answered. However, we will attempt to respond to your questions in the comments section in the coming days. With us, we have Chatham Kent Mayor Darren Caniff, Ward 2 West Kent Councillors Melissa Harrigan and Mark Ochier, Chief Administrative Officer Don Shropshire, Fire Chief Chris Case, Community and Human Services General Manager April Rydek, Thomas Kelly, our General Manager of Infrastructure and Engineering, Kathy Hoffman, our General Manager of Corporate Services and Chief Human Resource Office, Officer. As well joining us today, we have Greg Rickford, Minister for the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry, the Assistant Deputy Minister, Jennifer Barton, Ian Kerr, Regional Director of Municipal Services Office, Western Region of Municipal Affairs. Nelson Luero, uh, Executive Director of the Social Assistance Policy. And Tim Beckett from the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office will be joining us. I uh, will begin with uh, uh, just a brief welcome from our Mayor, Darren Caniff, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad everyone could tune in. Uh, Right early on a Saturday morning. I'm thrilled that uh, we've had so many people joining in and uh, one of our special guests is Mr. Greg Rickford. And uh, before before we get started anything else, I wanted to pass it over to, uh, to him to say a few words. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. And uh, far be it for all addition to be a first in a few words, but I'll do my best. I'm uh, actually, uh, in the Perry Sound District here on my way down from Sudbury, my family and I took a day to make some announcements at the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund um, uh, Science North and uh, spent the day with their activities. So we're making our way back down to Etobicoke. So I apologize for being in the car, but this has all come together uh, so quickly. Uh, folks, uh, let me begin by just saying this uh, all along from the beginning of the summer um throughout um and to this day uh, our top priority has been the public safety and the protection of uh, ontario communities in this case uh, wheatley and the surrounding area and that remains our top priority we're committed to working collaboratively with you as we have been and uh, we're here to support your efforts not just in the investigation uh, but also in the recovery moving forward from the obvious devastating explosion that occurred in Wheatley last month. The province will continue to work with the experts on the technical side to determine the source of the gas leak and look at options for next step to support you and your community through this challenging situation. So as I said earlier, this came together very, very quickly and I appreciate uh, Jennifer, uh, my uh, assistant deputy minister and the work that she's been doing on the ground, not just throughout, but as the premier and I uh, left uh, our community visit and as is often the case, um, we, uh, we um, put plans into action fairly quickly and we rely on a great team uh, to work with, uh, work with community officials to, to bring to fruition um, some of the things that we thought might help should the community identify in its leadership that, that this is um, the right path to go down. So I appreciate the collaborative approach taken by uh, your worship and the dedication of the entire town of Wheatley uh, during uh, this difficult time. And I want to assure you that we are uh, with you, as I said, and as the Premier said, and our government will continue to work effectively, taking all and any necessary steps to provide the help uh, that this town needs and that this town deserves from its provincial government. I've said clearly that public safety is our top priority. The integrity uh, of the rest of the downtown and the residents proximal to that uh, remain our top priority. And we have mobilized quickly to provide all of the technical support and funding to the municipality of, of Chatham Kent to help recover uh, from this event. The province contracted an expert engineering consultant. Uh, Golder Associates is a world-class company 
that works in this uh, area to conduct a comprehensive investigation into the source of the gas leak and the options for next steps. To protect the safety of workers in the evacuation zone, gas monitoring equipment is running 24 hours a day. And as this engineering work unfolds, Boulder will report back to me uh, and the municipality to provide frequent updates uh, on their work and keep all parties informed. That was an important takeaway, obviously, from, uh, from the visit. Uh, we are also bringing in uh, additional resources. We are retaining a third party expert from Alberta who actually specializes in gas leak detection to support Golders work. We want to get you all back into your homes and your businesses as soon as possible. So we've doubled down on the technical support that we uh, will be providing. We're also working together with the municipality to ensure residents have access to important social services, as well as food, housing, transportation, clothing, and healthcare for dispatch residents. Uh, and we recognize that there's more work to be done. Obviously, some of those essential services um, are in the area that is currently uh, cordoned off in the downtown core. So that's why on behalf of the Premier uh, and, I'm, and our government, I'm pleased to announce today that we are providing an initial $2 million in targeted funding to meet the needs of local businesses to cover costs which include temporary uh, relocation and leasehold improvements the funding is intended to ensure that directly impacted businesses can resume operations so that they can provide goods and services in the community we are also working with the mayor's office on the details and we'll have more to say about the specifics of this program very shortly. Uh, as the Premier and I saw firsthand, local businesses are the heart and soul uh, of Wheatley's community and their absence is making it difficult to rebuild and heal. Under Premier Ford's leadership, we're taking another important step with this funding announcement to help the town of Wheatley and its residents recover from the tragic event. We understand, folks, that there's more work to be done but we're here for you. We're ready to help uh, today and moving forward. I wanna thank you for this opportunity. As I said, I wish that I could have returned to Wheatley uh, for this important announcement, but I suspect that there'll be more work uh, and more uh, announcements to make as we support the community of, uh, uh, of Wheatley and the surrounding area. So thank you very much for, for this opportunity, uh, folks and all, um, uh, I'll, I'll sign off there. I'm, I'm prepared to take some questions and, and comments uh, for a bit here. Uh, thank you, Minister Rickford. Uh, we appreciate you uh, spending some time with us this morning. I'll now turn it over to our CAO, John Shropshire, please. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the support of the Premier, uh, yourself, and the government is greatly appreciated. Um, I, I know that we may not have you for um, the, the entire hour and a half today, so uh, I would invite Amy, if there's any questions that come in for the Minister, please don't hesitate to interrupt me, uh, and we'll make sure that uh, we have the opportunity to, uh, for Minister Rickford to respond to any of those questions. Um, I, I'd like to uh, start off and say that the, the initial plan for doing the in investigation and trying to, to uh, identify the source of the gas leak uh, has been shared with the municipal team. Um, and so the, here's some, some hard messaging to receive, but, uh, and also we'll talk about how we can deal with it together. But we looked at the initial um, investigation to try and find the source of the gas leaks, and it could take up to six months. Um, there's going to be every effort, as the minister uh, said, to try and uh, provide the technical resources so we can speed that along. But the priority is going to continue to be uh, public safety. And we need to make sure that before people are going back into their properties, whether it's a residence or a, a business, that we know that it can be done safely. And the big challenge all along, even since June, has been we don't know what the source of the gas leak is or what the H2S gas is. Um, we need to find that source and we need to find out whether there's anything to be done to mitigate it or remediate that so it's uh, we can make determinations whether it's safe to come home. 
So that's the uh, the challenge, the um, type of support that the minister has just announced in terms of our direct support to businesses and some of the additional support that's being uh, developed to support our residences is intended to make sure that we have supports in place for all of our residents for as long as they're out of their properties and businesses. And um, the next steps for us are going to be that um, our team that has been meeting with businesses and residents over the course of the last month will be reaching out again uh, in the coming week to have a, uh, another appointment of um, a direct conversation with uh, each of the residents and business owners. And our intent is now that we know that we could be uh, up to six months with this um, investigation, how does that reframe the type of support that's needed? I, I know a number of people have had temporary um, plans in place. We want to make sure that uh, if you're going to be out of your, your homes or businesses for several months, we need to make sure that there's plans in place that are going to support you during that time period. And I know that's probably been the most uh, frequently asked question that people want to know. So what's next and how long is it going to take? So um, that's the message we have today. And uh, the commitment we're making for you is that uh, we're going to try and do everything we can even though it's an extended time period to make sure you've got the support that you need. So with that, I, I'm going to uh, turn it back to our our, uh, our, our friends with the provincial government. Um, Jennifer Barton, is there any additional comments you'd like to make on the front end from the investigation piece before we open it up to questions? Thanks, Don, and um, thanks uh, to both you and the minister for your comments to get us started off today. Um, so appreciate being back here. I think this is my second uh, town hall here with the group and um, delighted to be back and, and uh, chat with all of you and interested to hear your questions and uh, answer whatever we can at this moment. Uh, I think I said last time and I would reiterate again, um, I've had the chance to visit Wheatley now a few times, uh, completely impressed by the community spirit and the leadership and um, the effort that everybody is putting into not only working with myself from a, from a provincial government perspective, but uh, all the work that you're doing to support each other and to work together to um, to move through this uh, this ongoing uh, emergency situation. Um, Don had asked me just to perhaps say a few words about uh, what's happening next uh, on the ground and at the site. So uh, I thought I'd do that just uh, before I get a, a, a number of questions about it. So hopefully this will help answer some of them. I am happy to report that uh, as part of the, the province's ongoing support to the municipality of Chatham, Kent and to the town of Wheatley, the province has contracted uh, an expert engineering consulting firm to conduct a comprehensive investigation into the source of the gas leak and to set out remediation options. So we're working closely with them. Um, the, the name of that consulting firm is Golder Associates, Associates, and over the course of the next several weeks, they will be working to identify the source of the emissions and the potential pathways. And as I said, look at how we either rem remediate or mitigate the, the, uh, the gas. They will be focused um, on soil and geophysical surveys uh, that will be done to delineate and map the extent and concentration of any subsurface gases and to locate potential subsurface wells and vents. The company will also identify any potential mitigation measures, as I mentioned. And Golder does have a detailed work plan in place and will continue to adapt the work plan um, as the results from the field work come in. I think Don mentioned that earlier. He's he's mentioned sort of a, we're saying about a two to six month time frame, um, which, which I know can be a little shocking, but uh, as Golder, as they are doing their field work and as they learn more, there may be areas of their detailed work plan that are able to move more quickly, um, you know, and, and depending on what they find, uh, there is potential for it to take slightly longer. We are also in the process of um, where we actually have just retained a third party expert from Alberta um, who is going to provide additional technical advice uh, and support the work being undertaken by both the municipality and the province. And so that team will be on site, I believe are arriving on Sunday uh, and they'll be working very closely with, with Goldar as well as with uh, the fire chief and, and a number of the municipal officials on site to continue just to ensure safety and to to ensure that we are looking at every possible option to move this forward as quickly as we can and, and to uh, to make sure that you have the full support you need to, to move forward. 
So that's sort of the details in terms of next steps. And so maybe I'll stop there and turn it back over to Amy, but happy to take any other questions. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that summary of uh, what's been happening the last uh, a few weeks. Uh, so there has been some questions, and I hate to put the minister on the spot, um, but um, people are wondering, and it's great news to hear that there's going to be some financial support for the local businesses of Wheatley, but people are wondering, uh, will the province be thinking about any financial support for the residents? Okay, so, so we're, a lot of that was wasn't clear here on on, uh, on audio. Yeah, I definitely here. understand. So I just walk in and, 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 and identify who you are again. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so it's moderator, and so people have been asking. It's wonderful that the province is going to be providing some financial support for the businesses of Wheatley, but the residents are wondering: Is the province going to have some conversations about the possibility of providing some financial support for the residents that have been affected? Or is it too early for that discussion at this point? Oh, well, it's never too late for the discussion. I mean, obviously, we're in the business of, of supporting the municipality. Uh, the municipality is leading this, just to be clear. Our role is to pro provide support where we've identified and understood that, that the resources of the municipality um, uh, may fall short of what businesses and residents um require to move forward with this uh so we'll take our lead from from your worship and and his uh, uh and his team including his chief administrative officer um jennifer is on the ground to uh, understand the signals as they evolve uh, i think it's fair to say that um based on our visit we saw an immediate need to uh provide some support to get uh, uh certain businesses um, from the downtown core up and running as quickly as possible, uh, perhaps at an alternative location. And uh, uh, we do recognize that there are residents who obviously may may not be able to go back to their homes for some uh, 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 for some period of time. Uh, we're working very quickly on the uh, and effectively on the technical elements of this. Um, and uh, uh, we'll take our signals from the municipality. So I encourage residents to um, uh, to make their um, uh, to, to make their uh, make it known to 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 uh, municipal officials on the ground um, what their concerns and what their needs are. And as I said, Jennifer's there uh, on a daily basis on behalf of the province uh, to bring that feedback to us and understand what. Um, uh, what the next priorities or steps may be in terms of uh, in terms of support. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we'll mo now move on to our CAO Don Shropshire, who has a comment. Th thank you, Amy, and thank you, Minister. Um, when we met with the Premier and the Minister uh, earlier this week, uh, that request for additional assistance for uh, the community residents was also shared, uh, and there was uh, some goodwill in terms of. Looking at that, we have a number of municipal, pardon me, both municipal and provincial government folks that are looking at trying to provide a package of services to support people over a six month period. Um, we were clear that not only do we need technical support to try and identify the source of the leak, but uh, the financial uh, burden of trying to provide support to everybody over up to six months uh, is, it extends normally what we would do as a municipal government. So the province has committed to come to the table uh, there are some other folks with the provincial government that are online right now that uh, may have some additional comments, but we will be looking at the following types of supports, making sure that people have a, a safe place to stay for the period that they're evacuated from their homes and their businesses. We're also looking at providing, uh, you know, basic needs such as uh, food and clothing. Um, we're also looking at uh, trying to work with different service providers be it water, electrical, or gas company to see if there's any consideration that can be given to any of those, um, you know, monthly charges. Um, anything we receive from those other companies will be shared as part of our regular updates. Uh, but I would encourage people, uh, if you're a client of one of those services, um, we can't pretend to speak for you. There's a, a need to, you to reach out and contact the utility companies directly if they have a specific question. But we will try and deal with some of those um, global issues that affect all of the residents that have been evacuated. So uh, lots of work underway. I'm, I'm 
Not sure if anybody on the, um, the provincial government side that's looking at additional support can offer some uh, additional information to uh, help the residents understand what support's available. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, so I just want to let those that are uh, listening through social media to let them know that we are monitoring the questions that are coming in and we're going to try to balance between questions coming in today and questions from uh, that had been pre-submitted. Uh, realizing there's lots of questions coming in about the cold weather coming up and next steps with that. Um, and I know that uh, April uh, Reidick, our general manager for Community Human Services, will be able to provide some of that information. And so um, I think I'm actually going to start with that particular question. So uh, we had a pre-submitted question from uh, Barb, and then it's been brought up by uh, Doug, Abe, Miss Ray, and Melissa about the cold weather and damages to their homes and businesses with uh, potentially not being able to, um, you know, uh, take care of pipes that may uh, be freezing. So I know that Thomas and April will have some uh, information to provide. So I think I'm going to start with April 1st. Uh, and then uh, for Thomas after for when he's available to use the screen. So April. Thanks, Amy. I will leave some of the technical questions uh, to, certainly to Thomas. My uh, team, in light of the information that has been shared uh, with everyone today, we have assembled a team of case managers that will begin on Monday calling all of the evacuated uh, residents. We have uh, our records show 60 unique households that are currently evacuated. 54 of those uh, households have attended the reception center and have provided us with their contact information. Some uh, of them came in very early in uh, the evacuation they had uh, other accommodations, other shelter uh, places where they could go and stay. Uh, and we haven't heard from them since that time. So others have reached out multiple times and we have assisted them uh, in any way that we can. So beginning on Monday, case managers will, uh, as I indicated, start calling all of the households that we are uh, aware of and have contact information on they will be asking a series of questions and we need residents to be as detailed as possible. Uh, everything from uh, do you rent or own? Uh, do you have insurance? Have you contacted your insurance company yet? Do you need assistance dealing with uh, your insurance company? How are you in terms of winter clothing? Uh, do you have a place that you can stay? for up to six months, or do we need to assist in looking at some alternative arrangements for you? So we, we will uh, begin that. That will take a couple days probably to get through all 60 uh, homes. So uh, the other thing that I would like to share uh, is that we are working very, very closely, both uh, now with the provincial government and certainly uh, some of the folks I work closely with are on this call as well, but we're also working with the Wheatley Disaster Recovery Group, the BIA, the Active Citizens and the Food Bank. The Food Bank is open today at 108 Talbot uh, certainly residents requiring any urgent assistance can attend that. Victim services is also available. So uh, this information will, will um, for some kind of be anticipated, expected. For others, it will be quite a shock. And for any residents who would like to uh, have a conversation with a counselor, can certainly contact victim services. And that number is 519-436-6630. We also have our homeless response line that is answered 24 seven uh, for anyone that finds themselves uh, not able to shelter uh, during this evacuation time. And that number is 519-354 six six two eight so we will continue to work with our partners 
We will continue to work with uh, the provincial government. But in order for us to get a really accurate uh, assessment of the needs of all 60 evacuated households, uh, we need to ask these questions. And uh, so hopefully we will be able to tackle that uh, this coming week. And uh, we will have as much information as we can to share. Uh, and I think Don said it well, we are gonna make sure that everybody has a roof over their head uh, and um, is able to safely uh, remain evacuated during this time. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Hi. April. And as we uh, prepare to have Thomas uh, join the conversation, so uh, Thomas, I'm going to have you for a couple questions in a row. Um, but Linda uh, was just asking if there's going to be a transcript for this event. Yes, uh, we will be having a transcription of this event. There's also one from the previous event that is available. And if those wishing to have a copy of the transcription of the previous event, as well as this one, if you would please email ckcommunications at chatham-kent.ca. And that information will be provided in the comment section. So Thomas, if you could uh, provide some additional uh, information on that previous question, please. Uh, if you could unmute your mic, please, Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, it's Thomas Kelly, General Manager of IES, uh, Infrastructure and Engineering Services. So uh, my, I'm going to answer the water question. And uh, just some introductory comments on the technical situation we have out there right now. So we are in a stable situation. However, we have many concerns uh, still, and we need to be very careful of any work we do out there. Uh, the reason is, is that I think as everyone knows that we had, uh, it's the term that we're using is a pressure relief situation of some uh, gas, form of gas, uh, certainly containing H2S, which is Highly, highly volatile and flammable, and uh, it's it's poisonous as well. So that's the situation we're in. Right now, there are zero readings across the board, but we have a history now. Uh, we had our first pressure relief on June 2nd, uh, and then it lasted a couple of days, and then it went down to zero. We had our second one on July 19th, and our third on August 26th. So uh, our concern is we're going to have another pressure relief situation, hence we're taking extreme caution on any work that's done out there. So with respect to the water, uh, what we're doing this coming week is we're going to shut off all the curb boxes. And this means all of the water that we shut off outside of private property. So there'll be no longer any pressure uh, associated with water coming into homes. Uh, when we get that done and as we work through that process, it is our plan to contact the homeowner and look at now removing the water that's going from uh, the municipal source into your homes. And we'll, uh, we'll set up a protocol, we'll contact you on that. We'll ask uh, for your permission to go into your homes to do that. Uh, we fully appreciate that the comment that it is a risk, uh, you know, as we, we have some time to resolve this certainly. Uh, because we don't have the cold weather yet, but uh, that is going to be part of the plan is that we essentially eliminate that source of water into your home, uh, looking at draining all of your hot water tanks as well and, and so on. But our first task is to shut off the pressure, all of the water uh, on the municipal side. And then uh, secondly, we will be reaching out to you and uh, uh, setting up a protocol to, to shut off and drain the water into your home. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, if you could just remain with me, Ms. Johnson has submitted a question and she was wondering, has there been an increase of sulfides in the water in Wheatley and has the water been tested? Yeah, so thank you. So all of the water supplied to Wheatley uh, that you use for drinking, bathing, showering, etc., it's all it's all a municipal water source. So there's no relation to any of the issues that we're receiving right now. Uh, when we get into the testing, we will look at the site specific area. We will get measurements of, of gases within the soil, within the, the water table and so on. But at this time, there is no risk to uh, drinking water because it's an entirely, entirely separate source. Thank you, Thomas, for that clarification. Uh, so not sure if this is a question that you could answer or maybe Don. 
Uh, but uh, several people are wanting, and, and in particular, Dave is wanting to know, are we going to monitor around town in case of other leaks develop? So I, I can take a crack at that if you like, or I can ask the, the, the chief of fire to do that. Uh, right now, uh, we are monitoring. We have a complete plan, which has been established by Golder as well, uh, the firm, the consulting firm mentioned. Uh, we have uh, perimeter, perimeter uh, monitoring uh, across the board. Uh, we're very confident in the monitoring that we have and that it essentially is, is measuring any form of gas that may occur. And again, all of those readings have been zero uh, for the, uh, really since the uh, explosion occurred. Thank you, Thomas. And we thank uh, our audience for their patience with us. The tool we're using only allows a certain number of people. And so Don Shropshire, Thomas Kelly, Kathy Hoffman, and our chief, Chris Case, are all working together uh, to uh, uh, share this one account. So, um, Madam, chief, Madam Moderator, can I? I was just going to ask if you would yeah. like to uh, provide some additional uh, clarification, please, Chief Case. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Chris Case, the, uh, the fire chief. And I want to thank. Uh, for the public, please note that the team is uh, practicing uh, six feet of social distance. Even though it, you could see the mayor in that one shot, it looked like they were closer than six feet. Uh, they are not. Uh, Chief, please. Good morning, everyone. So this is Chris Case, the fire chief. So first of all, I, I want to again thank everyone for the cooperation. The, uh, the, the, the way that the public have interacted with the firefighters and the engineers on scene has been great, and, and thank you for that. We continue to have four firefighters from Chatham Kent on scene 24 hours a day in various shifts. They are the volunteer firefighters from all over the uh, from all over the municipality, and we also have our full-time firefighters working through the night. We continue to have four hazardous materials technicians from the provincial hazmat team again on site 24 hours a day, and on top of that, now we have the air monitoring specialist from Goldar who have also got uh, equipment in the area. So we do have a lot of gas monitoring going on right now. In the event that we have another release, part of the challenge, and we have had some questions about what the plan is. Some of the variables that we have to deal with is the fact that we don't know how much gas there would be. We don't know the wind direction, the weather conditions, and these are all factors that affect um, the, the area. I can tell you that the very first question that I ask in every single technical meeting is, are we content with the current size of the evacuation zone? That has been our number one priority. In the event that we get another release, we would immediately deploy those hazmat um, resources out upwind. So we'd be worried about a plume, we'd be worried about gas traveling around the site. And as we did immediately after the explosion, we'll deploy the meters and we will try and ensure that there is a perimeter around the gas so that we actually know the limit of the gas. And the firefighters, the police officers will be coming door to door to anyone who is affected and giving them the advice that they need to leave. Those of you who have received a visit, not only from the fire department, but also from some of our municipal staff who volunteered to come door to door to collect information and to try and help people, they will be receiving that call. And we also know now where the more vulnerable people are, the people that will need more help getting out of their home. So all of that is currently in a, in a plan, which is in the command unit which is currently the uh, the weekly library. But if we have to consider if the gas travels towards the library, we also have a mobile unit that we can deploy. So we, we do have a lot of operational results on the scene. <clears throat> we have allowed people to come back to their homes. There's been a number of occasions where people have attended the resource center and come up with some significant concerns such as medication or uh, documents, that type of thing. And the incident commander has done everything he can to try and accommodate people wherever possible. But I would ask, please don't show up at the scene and, and ask for entry because that creates quite a quite a situation because the, the team are currently deployed around the scene. So if, if it's all possible, please go to the resource center. When we have a plan for the water and for the homes, we will do everything we can to accommodate that. Our number one concern is people's safety, but we also have to consider the fact that your homes are in there and we want to do everything we can to try and make this horrendous situation as easy as possible for everybody. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, uh, and uh, I'll pass it back to uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, Chief Case, if you could actually stay with me for a moment, please. 
Um, there's uh, a few other questions that have come forward, and uh, I'm not sure if maybe um, uh, Tim Beckett from the Interior Fire Marshals what, might want to jump in uh, at the end regarding a specific question, but if I may. Uh, so there's been a couple questions that people are looking for clarification on things with regards to evacuation and having to ensure that they have an evacuation bag and plan ready, but also uh, more specifically, uh, they're concerned that those that are in the uh, out, just outside the perimeter of the evacuation zone, is that still considered safe? Uh, are there plans to reevaluate the evacuation zone and extend it? And then in addition to that, has there been any plans in uh, identifying um, a process for evacuating the public school and daycare if needed? I know I've, I've kind of jumped a, a, a few questions in there, but maybe we can start with, uh, is there any plans to extend the evacuation zone or reassess the evacuation zone? Thank you. An excellent question and one that we ask ourselves every, every, every day. So right now we have engineers arriving on site, work will take place. And before any work takes place, we ask for a threat assessment about what that could do to the evacuation zone. And one of the reasons that we're pleased to have this uh, subject matter expert <laughs> arrive on site tomorrow from Alberta is that she is really the person who can give us that advice about what could happen when we start to do works around the area of the explosion. But for now, we are considering the site to be stable. And we believe that if there was a release of, of gas, we have the resources on scene to be able to safely manage it. Um, could the evacuation zone increase? Yes, it could. It could because we, we still are dealing with things that we just don't know. And again, I, I sound frustrated because we, we don't know what we're dealing with, which is not an easy position for a fire and rescue service to be in. In terms of um, the school, and some of the, the daycares and some of the care homes in the area, we have done a threat assessment of a square kilometer around the area, which stretched into Leamington. So our head of corporate services, Kathy Hoffman and her team have been working with Leamington because we realized that there is potential there. And we are trying to, in fact, I think we've contacted every home and business within that kilometer area to gather that information and provide reassurance about what to do if someone comes knocking on the door. Is there another question, Madam Moderator? Uh, yes, uh, Chief Case, uh, but this might be something that might be uh, better answered uh, by Tim. So I'm going to bring Tim in with you. So Tim is from the Ontario Fire Marshal's office and people are concerned about the type of uh, items they should maybe have an evacuation uh, plan and bag. And I know this sounds like a very mundane question for those of us that are not in the current situation, but there's lots of anxiety to our residents. And I know the Ontario Fire Marshal Office has some amazing resources. But Tim, could you maybe uh, just uh, talk briefly about the process of families being ready with an evacuation uh, uh, bag, if you may, please? Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, with respect to uh, emergency uh, evacuation kits, um, it's suggested that everybody have a 72 hour uh, kit with them um, for the quick onset of having to leave their home. Um, that would include uh, things such as some, some extra clothing, um, bottled water, uh, obviously uh, looking at uh, making sure uh, medicine is uh, readily available so that when your uh, medication, so that when you're you're leaving your house, you're taking your medication with you. Um, and, uh, you know, anything that, uh, um, obviously your, your, some money and, uh, you know, your, your wallet credit cards, make sure that they're readily accessible in your kit. Um, you know, the, the whole idea here is that, uh, in these situations, when you're looking to, um, to leave your home, you're just not sure when you're getting back. And, uh, uh, you know that aspect. Uh, you know, is 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 a daunting uh, thought uh, of not returning. But we want to make sure you have your essentials with you when you go. Um, if you if you go to the uh, Ontario website uh, under the emergency management section, you'll be able to see different uh, different areas and information related to uh, evac or to uh, seventy two hour kits. Uh, in, in the event of an evacuation. So thanks for the question. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, we're now going to uh, go back to Minister Rickford. Uh, he has some um, closing comments uh, for us, please. 
Minister. Yeah, thank you, moderator. Um, look, I just want to take this opportunity, maybe before I lose uh, reception uh, back up here again, to thank everybody for their work. Clearly, uh, we've heard from the fire marshal's office and and from our frontline fire uh, folks on on the ground that there um, is no question that the public safety remains uh, the top priority in the immediate area. Uh, it's nice to hear that our technical support that we're bringing in to help the municipality is um, is going to be a, an incredible asset. Um, and and finally, folks, um, I, I know this this uh, town hall meeting will go at least another hour. I want you to all know that that residents and or businesses with respect to any technical questions you might have where the province is implicated. We do have, in addition to Jennifer, who's amazing, um, uh, on the ground there, and we have ears on from the other appropriate uh, ministries, including uh, the municipality, the Ministry of Municipality uh, and Housing. Um, so, as I said, our resources, just um, from from the standpoint of what we're supporting now and what we could support in the potential, are being driven by you. Uh, and we've got your back, and we're looking forward to um, uh, helping out uh, um, in in any way that that that, that we can. Um, and support uh, leadership on the ground to um, uh, to make this uh, period of time not just as quick uh, as possible, but as safe as possible, and addressing uh, addressing obviously the important economic implications and various other things that displace businesses and residents in the downtown Wheatley uh, area are um, uh, are impacted by. Them. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I get I look forward to getting down to Wheatley in the not too distant future to see how things are going and uh, I'll, I'll sign off. Appreciate you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your time. I'm going to bring Don Shropshire, CAO, back uh, to talk about some next steps. Uh, just want to reassure the citizens we are monitoring your questions, trying to do a balance between those pre-submitted as well as those being posted this morning. And uh, Don will provide a summary of some next steps and we'll get right back to your questions that have been submitted. Don? Thanks, Amy. I I've seen a number of the comments coming and people are frustrated or it's not, you don't think we're giving clear answers for it. So let me try and go back and clarify. With respect to the, the different responsibilities, the municipality has primary responsibility for the emergency response and providing emergency services to our, our, our people that have been evacuated. So shelter, food, clothing, th those are things that the municipality traditionally and uh, in this case has primary responsibility for. We, when the premier was in town with the minister uh, earlier this week, uh, we did say this is extending our resources and we're asking for additional help, but there's a recognition that that's the primary responsibility of the municipality. Um, we have also said, as it relates to the emergency response, we have limited expertise dealing with a situation where there's hydrogen sulfide gas. So that's since the uh, since June, we have had to reach out and we've been uh, fortunate to receive the support from the provincial government for gas monitoring and the provincial hazardous materials team. So we couldn't have done that without that support and that continues to be in place. Um, the piece where we see the province, um, you know, having a huge role to play is the identification of the source. And we welcomed um, the ministry, Minister Rickford and his team, uh, hiring Golder and the um, additional technical expertise from Alberta to work on identifying the source. Um, so that's good. The next steps are going to be really maintaining that evacuation area, continuing to monitor, as Chris Kay said. Um, and then the, the team has already been on place. Like I, I should say, have they been on site in the last week since the, um, the, the uh, Ontario Fire Marshal's Office finished their investigation and the next week was clearing up the site. Uh, last week was spent doing all of the locates because there's an identification that there may be some, you know, monitoring other things mm -hmm. happening on the site. They've spent that last week uh, identifying where all the utility locates and so on are. And over the course of uh, starting this coming week, there's going to be the investigation started to try and find the source. When we find the source of the gas, or we have more information around that, it'll guide our next steps. But right now it's been a step-by-step -step process. So um, I, I hope I've tried to clarify in terms of where we are. If there's specific questions that I haven't touched on, please put those in the chat function. The intent is to try and give you direct answers. And uh, if you're feeling frustrated, then try and clarify, please, what uh, what specifics you need to know. But 
The intent is now to find the gas uh, source and then there's recommendations and a plan developed to mitigate it. Right now, until we find the source, we don't know what that plan is, nor can we confirm how long it's going to take. So that's the uh, the unknowns right now. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thanks, Don. I'll keep you with me for just one moment. Uh, so Barb submitted a question. Why didn't we do this on uh, June uh, 3rd? So you just alluded to uh, the unknown with the situation. Could you maybe uh, just explain to the citizens as yeah. to uh, what steps, uh, why certain steps were taken when they were pleased? So in June, again, we, we had even less information in June. When we had the initial gas leak on June the 2nd, uh, we consulted with some technical experts as well, asking some of the same questions. In June, we were told that it was recommended basically to continue monitoring for an additional, like up to a month, after a month, we were told that there was no other indication that we would do, we should be doing any other exploratory work. They said this could have been a one only event or once only event and that uh, trying to go in and start doing, you know, digging or so on to try and find the source uh, was not recommended. Uh, it really wasn't until we had the recurring events and the explosion that it was a, it was, there was a change in the position of the, the technical advice. And that was given that there's, you know, these other events, now we believe that it's a, there's a possibility of a reoccurrence and our best course of action is to try and spend the time to do the identification of the source of the hydrogen sulfide gas and to look at what steps could be done to remediate it or uh, um, mitigate any sort of future events. So that's really the steps we're working on now and uh, it's been slow for all of us. But that's why we didn't do it in June because we thought it could be a once only event. Now that we've had uh, three gas releases and the explosion, we the technical advice has changed, and that's the steps we're taking right now. Uh, I will say one other thing that if there's if there's any confusion around the um, the roles of the ministry and the uh, or the different the provincial government ministries and the municipality, we have made a commitment that we're working through a very complex situation together, and we are trying to collaborate. The minister said it well a moment ago. The province recognizes this as our home and we have to be involved in all of the decision making. Uh, but we're also sitting back and saying we don't have some of the expertise. So this has to be something we're doing together. That's the only way we're going to actually get to a, uh, a solution. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Don, if you could just stay with me. Uh, there's a few other questions that you'll be able to assist me with. Uh, Wendy would like to know where is the police prom police presence you promised? Uh, some other people uh, had uh, also mentioned that uh, they don't really uh, have a lot of uh, visual of police or the security guards that were supposed to be in the area. Please. So we've had two things. We have two officers on site 24 hours a day. Uh, the majority of the work that they've had or concerns been expressed in the last uh, two weeks have been related to traffic control, but they're also in place for security reasons. So um, we have a security uh, team that's been hired to monitor the uh, the points for um, entrance to the evacuation area for emergency personnel. They've been trying to provide that support, but it's really the police that have the overall responsibility. If someone was to uh, not respect the uh, the boundaries of the evacuation area, they could charge people or take additional steps. Um, but in addition, the police services have been present and they continue to be present 24 hours a day uh, to provide additional support and to um, uh, take additional steps if people are not respecting the evacuation area. So they have been present and I've been receiving regular comments from our citizens when they've had a complaint, it's gone through to police services. And as I said, the majority of them have been traffic concerns and those have been resolved. Uh, so Don, another one for you as well. Uh, so Barb uh, had posted, pre-posted a question to us about um, some damage being to the homes because people not being there and, and moldy items in the fridge and freezers and miss ray and quite a few other people this morning have posted the same and and for yep. those who were maybe not on the event with us uh the two weeks ago uh we do have a transcript and, and that video is still up for people to listen to uh the insurance board we have a representative uh from the insurance board talking to uh, next steps but could you maybe just talk about um for when those, when it's safe for people to be able to re-enter their homes and, and maybe some steps they need to do with regards to uh, damage inside their homes that deals with uh, food and furniture, please. So Chief Case talked about people getting in uh, access to their homes or their businesses. Uh, we will do that as soon as it's safe to do so. Uh, but we still, we need to have that additional expertise from um, Boulder and the technical experts to come in and advise us whether there's any part of the evacuation area where we can provide additional access. 
we've taken some extraordinary steps to provide access to people, you know, people that might have, you know, medical assistive devices and so on. There's been very limited time access to get into homes, but things like, um, you know, spoiled food in the fridge and, and so on, we recognize that's going to have to be taken care of. There are services available to provide that type of support. Uh, you know, whether those are um, access through your insurance coverage with your home or some other form, that's going to be done in due course. But right now, our priority still is on determining whether it's safe to provide access. The same thing would be true for uh, people going in and doing a, a, um, an assessment of the structural integrity of the home, whether there was any damage as a result of the explosion. Um, our chief building officials have not been able to go in and do that as well. We're also waiting for that additional assessment uh, by the uh, technical experts uh, that the province has engaged, and we're hoping that's going to start as early as tomorrow uh, for them to reassess uh, whether there's any additional access. But right now, we still can't provide that access because we don't know whether it's safe to do so. So and as soon as we do, we will send out the messages and we'll make sure that it's a, um, a clear message as to when people can provide ac get access and, and do the types of cleaning you're talking about. But that will likely be several weeks away. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, so that was a nice segue. I just uh, remaining with your camera, if Thomas could maybe come into the screen. Um, so uh, a pre submitted question from Sharon was, and you just uh, spoke briefly about it is when will engineers be able to access our homes to let us know when we have sustained structural damage. And I know that uh, Abe has posted this morning, are there any rumors about taking buildings down? Is that true? So Thomas, if you could maybe talk about, uh, just reiterate um, about um, the people's homes being reviewed for uh, structural damage and then also about the rumors of buildings being taken down in uh, the downtown area, please. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so uh, again, the, the situation on site is it's stable, uh, but we will not be conducting any work that is not absolutely required in our focus right now is to determine the source of the leak. Uh, we fully expect that we're going to have another pressure relief uh, situation here. It's all, it's impossible to say. It could be weeks, it could be months, but it's uh, most likely going to occur. And as a result, uh, the, the approach we're taking is that our, our chief building official is holding on any type of evaluations on any of the building uh, just to minimize the risks until we have some confidence that uh, we have a much more stable and safe situation. So once that occurs, uh, the CBO, the chief building official, will go to each building and he will do a preliminary assessment. He will look at the building and determine uh, was there structural damage. And if he suspects structural damage, he will ask for an engineer's report, a structural engineer's report uh, to, uh, to go through and determine what needs to, to be modified. So that will be uh, managed by the owner and uh, he will reach out as he goes through that. So uh, there's nothing uh, any residents need to do at this time. When our chief building official goes through that evaluation, he will be reaching out to each business or homeowner and advising them such of the status of their building and what actions, uh, if any, need to be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm I'm going to be bringing Jennifer back in. Uh, so uh, there was a question from uh, Melissa submitted this morning, and I'm not sure if this is something you can answer, but maybe you can help explain the difference between federal and provincial and how they, they work together. But Melissa would like to know, is there any federal aid available? Thanks, um, Amy, for the question. And thanks, Melissa, for asking it. Um, it's a really great question. So um, Don, I think, talked a little bit earlier about um, the, the work that's happen happening collaboratively between the municipal government and the provincial government. And, and we both have you know, active roles in responding to this emergency. Uh, the province is reaching out and is working with the federal government. Um, at this time, we haven't identified any specific uh, supports, um, but we will continue that discussion. Um, with them, particularly around um, some of the future work that we would like to do uh, around gas wells. So more to come on that as we know more and as we continue the conversations with the federal government. But at this point, um, 
the what's happening on the ground and uh, sort of the responsibilities as they're broken up between different levels of government fall within both the municipal and uh, the provincial roles. Um, and as Don chatted, ch mentioned earlier, um, you know, the collaboration between the province and the municipality at this point is um, is is going really well. Uh, lots of conversations, lots of different players involved. Um, initially, our priority, obviously, the ministry that I work for was sort of initially in town and, and the priority was really around uh, sorting out the the source of the gas and, and what those options would be. As we've gone sort of deeper into the emergency, um, many other ministries have come to the table. I do have some of my colleagues here on the line with me today. And you're going to see over the weeks and months ahead, uh, many other ministries involved in the response, working closely uh, with the municipal government. So the minister announced uh, $2 million supports this morning for businesses. Um, my colleagues uh, from the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade uh, are working closely with the Municipal Economic Development Group. Uh, so they'll be focused on that work. We have our colleagues uh, from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing on the line today. They are uh, working closely with um, April, who spoke earlier, and the Social Services Department around uh, housing needs and um, emergency uh, funding uh, for residents. So that work will continue. I've got my colleagues on the line from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, again, working closely with April's team to ensure sure that um, you know any residents who need resources have access to them. So lots of different uh, players here um, and, um, and we'll continue to work very collaboratively with the municipality and I mentioned I think in my opening comments the I've been completely impressed by the um, and thankful for the role the municipality is playing and it, it's become very easy for us to all work together. Uh, we have a number of different committees and leadership groups set up who are, um, you know, talking daily about what your needs are and how we can best support them. So we'll continue to do that going forward. Um, and as I said, we will continue to uh, speak with the federal government as well. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And so as you uh, mentioned, we have Nelson and Ian with us. So Ian is from the Municipal Services Office of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, and Nelson is the Executive Director of Social Assistance Policy. So um, I, I, I don't want to, uh, I want to make sure that we include them in this. And so maybe uh, Nelson, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move over to Ian, if you can maybe just explain how, uh, as Jennifer said, how you've been working with April's team and what type of supports you've been providing for Wheatley. I'll start with you, Nelson. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, we have been working very closely at here at the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services with April and her team. Uh, we have uh, Melissa, that is our program manager, working very closely uh, with April on assessing, as the minister said, really assessing what is the need and, and, and that need driving uh, in terms of what our response needs to be. Uh, here at the ministry, uh, as some of you may be aware, we provide emergency supports through a program called emergency assistance. Um, April mentioned she will be reaching out to individual families uh, and impacted uh, residents uh, to assess that need. We will be meeting in our meeting with April on a daily basis to make sure that we are providing the supports necessary to address uh, the, the, the financial requirements uh, that are provided through the social assistance programs um, and assessing what additional needs are, are, are required and working with my colleague uh, Ian, which will speak next at the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to make sure we're addressing the, the needs uh, appropriately. And again, reiterating the minister, you are really driving uh, that need. So the more information you can provide, the better we can assess the need and, and respond accordingly. Thank you. Uh, so, Ian, I'll add you to uh, for for your comments and and how your uh, organization is able to assist the municipality. Thanks, and <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, I would reiterate what the minister said that we're very interested in hearing uh, from you about what it is you need uh, in the longer term. Given the information you heard today about the length of time this might take uh, in hearing what. Uh, residents' needs might be in the long term to evaluate what additional provincial assistance might be needed. So uh, we're working closely with Don and April and their team uh, in understanding right now those needs. So I encourage you to um, to uh, provide that information to the Resource Centre. I understand from uh, the municipality today that they're going to be reaching out to each of you again. And uh, uh, as April pointed out, a clear understanding of those needs will help us understand uh, 
where there might be gaps going forward. So we're going to work closely with uh, April and Dawn in understanding those uh, and thinking about what additional supports might be um, might be needed in your community. For those of you who uh, have uh, insurance, I just encourage you to reach out to your insurance providers as well. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm repeating something you've already done, but I encourage you to do that in, in those cases where you have uh, that available to you to take advantage of of that uh, source as well. But we'll work closely with April. We're meeting regularly to understand uh, what it is you need, and you can please communicate to them uh, whether those needs have changed given what you've learned today. Uh, thank you, Ian. I will bring back April uh, to the stream. So there's a couple questions coming in that hopefully you might be able to assist me with, April. Uh, Shanna had submitted a, a question uh, earlier this week. What is the progress on getting Wheatley uh, residents back to um, a permanent housing rather than temporary housing? Would you be able to speak to that, please? Thanks, Amy. Sure. And I think uh, certainly uh, Nelson and Ian have touched on that. So when uh, we, we are assisting some residents who did not have uh, family or friends that they could quickly go and uh, stay with during this evacuation time, now that the evacuation is going to be significantly longer, uh, like I indicated earlier, we will be reaching out to every household within that evacuation zone and doing that deeper assessment to figure out what are the, those longer term housing needs. So some of the things that we will look at uh, really is available housing stock. Certainly, um, I don't need to tell anyone on this call that uh, rental accommodations are very limited in Chatham-Kent. They're limited in Essex, but we do have staff that are working to, to see if we can find some other rental locations. We will be looking at uh, things like um, bed and breakfasts, cottages, any of those things that can be used during uh, the winter. We'll also be looking at, I know Premier Ford uh, mentioned about, uh, is there the ability to set up a temporary kind of trailer uh, mobile home uh, scenario? We're, we're exploring that to see what that looks like. Uh, that might take a bit uh, longer, but certainly that's one of those options as well. We will also look at uh, kind of hotel stays, not great, not ideal. Um, some of the questions we'll be asking when we begin calling will be uh, on top of shelter, transportation issues, uh, work issues. Some people have been displaced and now have to drive much further to be able to get to their place of employment. Um, others have been displaced and uh, were working in a business that uh, is now shut down. So every single scenario will be very different. Some individuals might be fine to stay with relatives for this time frame if they can uh, access some transportation supports or some food supports, some rent uh, assistance, any number of things. That's why uh, when our case managers begin those calls, uh, we really are going to be asking uh, some lots and lots of questions and we really need details. We cannot get a good picture to bring back to the province unless we have that information uh, from each of our households. So I'll stop there. Amy, I hope uh, that helps answer that process. It does, April. I'm actually going to stay with you for the next few questions, if I may. Um, so Wanda has posted, is it true that evacuees are being told they have to use their savings before receiving money from what has been raised through fundraising? I'm not sure if you can answer about the fundraising part because um, that is actually being uh, maintained from a, a group outside of the municipality. But uh, could you maybe speak to the uh, comment or the question about people having to use up their savings before receiving uh, funds maybe from an alternative source, please? Sure, thanks Amy. So I will start with the disaster relief funding. So we are working with uh, the Wheatley Active Citizens, the Wheatley BIA and the Wheatley Food Bank. They are uh, certainly the keepers of the donated funds. 
uh, and certainly the community uh, right across uh, Chatham Kent and all of the areas around us have been very generous uh, donating to that source. We would like to make sure that uh, those funds are are really handled uh, well, and that group uh, is doing a great job with that. So before they begin to tap into those donated dollars, we really want to explore what is available uh, to the citizens of Wheatley through the provincial government. Uh, what, and, and Jennifer certainly talked about uh, the federal government as well. Uh, and we, we want to explore all of those options and, and like I indicated earlier, get a real handle on the picture for what it looks like for every single household. What, uh, in conversations that I had uh, with the government on Friday, uh, we want to do everything possible so that uh, the displaced citizens of Wheatley do not have to tap into savings do not have to tap into RRSPs. Um, and, and so th that's why those detailed assessments become so, so important as we move forward. With uh, some of our social services regulations that were mandated by, uh, with respect to assisting individuals of low income typically, uh, or we're called in to assist during emergencies, we always ask those questions. What, what uh, do you need something right away? Do you need food? Do you need money? Do you need transportation? Do you need shelter? Uh, and some of the questions around social assistance, there are a lot of rules around that. And, and one of those uh, rules is, what do you have in savings? What are your assets? Uh, uh, and the like that, that go around that. But that's what uh, we're working with, with the provincial government. Uh, Nelson kind of mentioned that. We're gonna be meeting with them moving forward uh, on a daily basis uh, to begin to unpack each individual household uh, and what a six month uh, now evacuation looks like for them. I hope that helps, Amy. Uh, thank you, April. Another question is Darlene would like to know, what about the being able to access Ontario housing? Is that an option? So when we look at our social housing, uh, certainly that wait list currently uh, for social housing is around five years. So not a quick uh, answer for that. Doesn't mean that individuals who would qualify for social housing cannot uh, submit an application and get uh, on that list. Certainly we always look at people that, uh, um, you know, some of that really looks at some financial assessments and things to, to access that. But we've got some other uh, things that we can look at, some things like rent geared to income, some uh, portable housing benefits, lots of things that can assist, uh, but each case is very, very different. And, and that's why we need to kind of start down this path of those really, really detailed assessments. There is not a lot of available uh, affordable housing in Chatham-Kent. It's something my team is, is really pushing for, uh, some significant builds around affordable housing the vacancy rate in Chatham-Kent is very, very low uh, and rents are increasing uh, just like they are right across the province. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, April. Uh, this might be a question that you can answer, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Nancy would like to know, are we trying to get the mail back to their town that having to drive to Leamington has, uh, to get their mail has not been convenient? Is that something you could uh, speak to? So I know that, uh, I don't know if we have anyone from our economic development team online, Amy, certainly uh, Stuart McFadden, Bruce McAllister, that group has been actively in conversation with Canada Post. So I'm, I'm gonna see if there's anybody else that can answer that question. April, I believe uh, someone from Shire might be able to uh, 
provide a bit of an update to that, please? Sorry, could you please repeat the question, Amy? I had some background noise I couldn't hear. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm being told that I have a bit of uh, reverb with my mic, so I do apologize to those listening today. Uh, so people were just wondering, has there been any additional work in trying to get their mail from Leamington back to Wheatley, that having to drive to Leamington has been uh, not convenient, and April thought maybe that the economic development team yeah, had made you. some progress, please. Thank you. Um, we have continued to reach out to Canada Post, um, Canada Post, like you know, a lot of the folks on this call were were waiting to find out how long are we likely to be out. Uh, when they were thinking it was going to be a couple of weeks, they uh, that was one set of solutions. Now that we know it's going to be, or it could be as many as uh, six months, uh, another set of solutions is being investigated. So Stuart McFadden is reviewing that with Canada Post. We're looking at seeing if we can get additional mail services. Um, there's also a service with Canada Post that. If you're unable to go and get your own mail, if you, um, it is possible to assign authority for someone else to pick up your mail uh, and deliver it to you. So there, there are a couple of workarounds in the short term, uh, but yes, we're continuing to work on that. Uh, thank you, Don. If you could stay with me, please. Uh, Abe was just wanting to know, there are a lot of people employed and working in the hot zone daily. Where is all the funding coming from? So perhaps you could give a summary of when the mayor declares an emergency, how that allows us, uh, meaning the municipality, to access additional funds during an emergency, if you could please. So the, the current, um, current situation is the mayor declared a state of emergency on July the 16th when we had the second um, gas uh, detected. Uh, it's been in a state of emergency ever since. Uh, to this current day, although the size of the evacuation zone has uh, changed uh, throughout that time period based on what the, the risk assessment was. And as Chief Case talked about earlier, that's evaluated on a daily basis. So uh, when a municipality responds and provides uh, emergency relief and, and the emergency social services like feeding, clothing, and so on, that is the responsibility of the municipality. We spent order of magnitude about one, uh, $1.2 million, probably more than that now. Um, there are provisions for the provincial and federal government programs to provide support or to reimburse a local government when those expenses take place. Normally that's, in our case, it would be, we'd be expected to spend somewhere in the order of $10 million or 3% of our annual municipal budget. Uh, given the extraordinary uh, factors around this situation, um, there may be some consideration providing some additional funding in that regard, but currently that's the expense of the municipality. I do want to acknowledge though that the um, the ministry has been responsible or has offered to pay for gas monitoring uh, related to the activities we've been uh, you know over the course of the last couple of months. So that's an expense that uh, the provincial government has offered to pick up. To be frank, we are we are more worried right now about making sure that we continue to protect your um, safety and provide for people's basic needs. Uh, we are cataloging all the funding, but um, right now that's uh, that's not the top priority. The top priority is your safety and trying to figure out what the cause of this gas re um, release is and then finding a way to get people back to their homes and businesses. So um, that's that's a quick answer to your question. There, there are going to be some uh, additional considerations by the province. Uh, based on comments made by the minister and, and earlier this week by the premier, but those are yet to be worked out. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, and I just received an update from our executive, or sorry, from our director of economic development, and that uh, he has spoken with Canada Post on Friday, and they are looking at a building in Wheatley, so they hope to have more information for the residents uh, next week. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Um, so another question that I'm not sure, maybe uh, April will be able to assist with, so I'll bring April back to the feed, is Janice wants to know, um, is there the option of using privately or publicly owned uh, buildings that maybe are currently used due to COVID that could be used as temporary business or personal shelters? So um, I know we don't have economic development because they would be the ones to talk about using a location for temporary business. And I know a lot of work has, has been done with that team to assist the bank and our, our pharmacy to have temporary locations available for our residents. But could you speak to maybe the process of uh, that you and your team go through trying to find uh, maybe locations within Wheatley that could be used for um, temporary shelter, please? 
Sure, Amy, thanks. It, um, you know, we have thought about this and certainly every time we have uh, an emergency, uh, every time we have to evacuate uh, and Wheatley certainly uh, has felt that over the last several months, we always assess, uh, do we want to move people into hotel rooms? Uh, certainly not ideal, uh, but it does offer privacy and access to kind of private showers, washrooms, uh, and the like around that. Uh, the difficulty is that they are not in Wheatley. And uh, on August 26th, we were moving people to Chatham to Windsor, to Leamington, uh, in a number of hotel rooms around uh, the community. We do always look at, uh, would we open up a emergency shelter? Uh, we have a storage locker that's full of cots and uh, blankets and pillows. Um, but that, that's not great either in terms of anything long-term. So certainly we will, uh, look at any and all options. We will uh, look at um, if there is any opportunity for, for whether they are homes that are vacant, whether they are uh, places that are, that are open for renting. Um, we've even thought, uh, certainly, are there any families that are willing to bill it to family? Um, for this period of time, but that comes with all kinds of other kind of um, kind of hoops to kind of jump through in terms of making that work. We have experience of operating a kind of cot bed shelter uh, and certainly would probably turn to a hotel uh, method before we would open up um, you know, say the arena and put cots in it. So, but certainly everything uh, is looked at and uh, we're open to to suggestions for sure. Thank you, Thank April. You. I'll bring Don back into the feed uh, so that he could uh, expand about help for business, please. Yeah, thanks, Amy. So economic development, the, the team has been working with a number of different property owners. Uh, it's similar to the residence situation that April described, there's not a whole lot of building stock in immediately in Wheatley. So we have been looking in the surrounding areas, uh, Tilbury and, and Leamington to see if we can find, and, and Chatham as well, to see if we can find additional space that could accommodate some of the, uh, the business owners. Uh, there are some businesses, you know, some of the, you know, restaurants and so on, it makes it a little bit tougher to uh, uh, put them in a, a general office space. Obviously they need specialized equipment and so on. But uh, over the course of the next week, when we reach back out again to business owners, uh, the economic development team will be discussing options with the, uh, the business owners. The minister's announcement today about some of the additional uh, $2 million relief package, some of that money is available to um, do leasehold improvements and so on to make uh, what space is available um, uh, appropriate or to, to modify it so people can move in and uh, operate their businesses over the uh, the next several months. So that will be more details will be coming directly to the business owners. We'll also make sure that the BIA is uh, kept abreast of that. Amy, if I if I could, if I, I'd just like to address, there was a couple of other related questions people had about damaged buildings and it was whether it was their residents or their uh, businesses. People were asking more about insurance coverage and how some of their claims may not be considered until they can get in for inspections. Uh, our economic development folks reached out to uh, the Insurance Bureau of Canada. They spoke with Anne-Marie Thomas and uh, her advice is that um, insurance agents are in a position where they can review your existing policies and open a claim even if they can't get in to inspect the building for the extent of the damages. If people um, have reached out to their insurance agent and they're not getting support in that area, she advised that the, uh, the Insurance Bureau of Canada or IBC, their Consumer Information Centre, uh, can provide direct support. Um, the number for that uh, insurance uh, information center is 1-844-227-5422. We'll post that on our website as well if people have information on the municipal website. But um, those people should be able to provide you support. They're generally in a situation where there's an emergency. Um, the 
the cost for cleaning up damages is shared amongst a number of different sources, including personal insurance and things like, you know, the people talked about spoiled belongings or things that had, you know, if there's mold in the basement because the sump pump hasn't been running and so on, those types of things might be picked up with your insurance coverage because of the difference in policies. You'd have to talk to your agent. Um, but those would be things that uh, the insurer and the IBC uh, folks can help you work through. And uh, we'll do our best to try and provide more information if it's required. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Don. I'm actually going to keep with you and then we'll transition into Jennifer. Uh, there's two questions here posted by Steve. So the first one, Steve, um, is wanting to know, uh, Don, uh, why do we not purchase the area at fair market value and let them get back to their lives? I'm sorry, you're asking why we can't purchase? Correct. So Steve's wondering, could the municipality or maybe the province, uh, could they not just purchase the area that is affected at fair market value so that they can have those funds to then move on with their lives? So maybe again, if you could uh, just uh, touch base on so, what the normal process is in, in a situation like this, please. So I, I think for me, there's, then the question becomes, what properties are we talking about? Uh, it's clear that there were, in the immediate vicinity of the blast, there was some properties that were damaged um, and those are you know they're pretty obvious that we have to deal with with uh, you know what's the long-term future of those but until we actually identify what the source of the emergency is we're not sure there's there's a high probability it could be coming from a gas well but there are other possibilities as well if there's a you know some sort of a, a, a pathway in the in the earth mantle and that's where some of the gas is seeping up it might be much broader than just underneath where the explosion occurred. Uh, you know, when we're talking about, we could be talking about two or three properties, but we could be talking about a hundred properties. And until we start looking at some of those long-term uh, solutions that Steve's talking about, we need to get our arms wrapped around what's the real cause here so we can look at a more comprehensive plan. So uh, I know that's taking time and it's frustrating for us as well, but I don't think it's as easy as just stepping up and saying, we're going to uh, purchase the properties. Um, I think the other, other piece, uh, you know, Frankly speaking, it's not like somebody came in and set off a bomb and you can say that's the person responsible. This is an event that we don't even know what the source is and who pays for that sort of activity, how that gets picked up. That's going to have to be sorted out once we understand the source. And it's not a, um, a direct responsibility of a, uh, a property owner or the municipality or the province until we can identify what the source is and the causes, and then we can sort of work through some of those things. But uh, um, that, that's the honest answer to the question. I, I wish it was uh, uh, less complicated and quicker, but that's where we're at. Thanks, Don. I'm going to stay with you, but uh, I've noticed there's been a, a few questions that have been put in about traffic around the affected area and just want them to know that I have seen their questions and those questions will be taken offline and uh, be able to speak with Thomas Kelly our general manager of infrastructure and engineering with his team uh, first next week as to uh, maybe what things can be done to help with traffic calming in the affected area. Uh, but Don, a question that was pre-submitted by Sharon and uh, also a question Tina has placed. So I'll say Tina's question first. Have you considered going outside the evacuated zone to see how far away that people have felt the blast and how they were affected? And I think that leads into Sharon's question where she talked about um, you know, we've mentioned the number of people that were uh, treated and injured, but that there were many other issues where uh, people were treated for concussion and lots with PTSD. Um, so I'm wondering if you might be able to speak to um, how the municipality is reaching out to those that were not really in the uh, immediate uh, evacuation zone, how they were affected yeah. and uh, dealing with the medical side and also maybe about victim services again, please. Right. So uh, all of the folks that have uh, attended the um, reception center initially at the at the arena, and now at 108 Talbot Street. Uh, and you if you talk to a caseworker, they also have access to the victims' uh, services, and those folks can provide um, both support for um, some of the psychological issues related to an explosion like this, or sort of dealing with the emergency. Victim services can provide that support. Uh, we're also encouraging people to speak with their uh, health care provider, their doctor or nurse, um, practitioner. I mean, those are some immediate supports that we, we're encouraging people to to, uh, to deal with. But if there's specific issues with that, we'd ask that you uh, raise those with a um, 
folks that working at the reception center, April's team, and we'll make sure you're put in touch with people that can provide that additional support. So the second part of the question, Amy, was? Uh, no, it was just, uh, I think you answered it, but uh, maybe just reminding people about oh, victim services yeah. and their yeah, availability so, to provide yeah, if, I, if I could just, with respect to how broad this was occurring, in the last 10 days or two weeks or so, we've had people as far away as Merlin identify the smell of gas. Um, we had uh, a number of calls. I mean, there were, were five to 10 call, calls a day into our uh, 911 service, people saying that they reported the smell of gas. You know, every one of those instances, the fire services team was went out with gas monitoring equipment to determine whether there was any gas. And we can tell you that there has not been any H2S gas detected in any of those instances, but we did determine that there was at least three inversions of Lake Erie where the, the water flips and the, the lower water flips to the top, uh, that stirs up a bunch of organic material and it, it causes smells that people, you know, thought might be gas. We've also had um, reports where there was some gas detected uh, related um, near a um, uh, some vegetation that looked like it had been dying off. Uh, in that situation, we went out again, detected the, um, uh, where there was low levels of natural gas above one of the um, Integris pipes. I beg your pardon, Enbridge pipes, I'm so sorry, um, our, our gas company's pipes, they identified, um, you know, uh, some trace elements and they took immediate steps to rectify that. Um, so I think in a situation where there's been an emergency, it's common to have people report smelling of gas. I think people are more sensitive to that. We're encouraging people to continue to call 911 if they think they smell gas. We'll follow up on every one and we want to make sure that we're uh, the residents are assured that um, we're taking every precaution to make sure that if there's any smells of gas that we'd uh, we'd investigate it and we'll we'll work with the community if there's any any reason for concern but so far there has not been any detected gas since or uh, you know related to the h2s gas explosion since the 26th of august thank you don one moment please okay so Chief Case is just reiterating that every 911 call is an emergency response and that's how it's treated. So we're taking those very seriously and chasing down everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Um, so if you could maybe trade places with uh, Thomas briefly, um, we were going to uh, have some questions for him that are dealing with traffic. So quite a few questions that are coming in um, from Missy Ray. And uh, that first question deals with um, we have a temporary all-way stop at Victoria and Buckingham, and that is a chaotic intersection. And that in addition to that, Lisa was adding, uh, she would like to, um, some additional uh, question on the saw horses on the west end of Foster Street need to be pushed back about four to five feet so people can stop cutting the corner onto Julian Street. So that's more of a comment, so a takeaway. And I'll, I'll share that information with you. Um, but uh, I'm just gonna go back uh, to Missy Ray's question. Uh, that um, they would like to know if we can have a temporary all-way stop sign at Victoria and Buck Buckingham if it because it is a chaotic intersection. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for the question. So it's something uh, we will look at, absolutely. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that we're always monitoring the traffic and the flows. And, and by the way, those traffic flows are often changing. Uh, so we just need to be very careful. Uh, safety is the priority, of course, uh, but we'll we'll have a look at that. We'll, we thank you for your suggestions, uh, but we do have uh, police presence on site. They're looking at it as well, and uh, my team always has representation in the area as well. So uh, we'll we'll look at that, and um, it's subject to change. Everything we have there now is subject to change based on the patterns that we're seeing. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm going to bring Jennifer back in. And so we have a question that I believe she might be able to answer. Steve would like to know, when is Golder going to be starting? And are they going to be working 24-7? Uh, if you can maybe um, uh, give us some information on, on, on that aspect of the project, please. Yeah, thanks, Amy, for the question. Um, and it's a great question, Steve. I know people are frustrated because they don't see a lot of action and activity happening on the site, but I do want to assure you that Goldar has started some time ago. 
Um, they have a detailed work plan in place and they will continue to adapt it um, as they go through the field work that, that they will be, you'll see them on site this week actually starting some very specific field work, but that doesn't mean that they haven't been doing a whole bunch of things in the background. Um, essentially since being contracted, Golder has been very busy working together as much knowledge as possible. They've been leveraging local community knowledge through interviews with local residents. Um, they've been meeting with the town staff. Uh, they've been working with provincial staff from um, what we call our petroleum operations section and our Ontario Geological Survey group. They've been sifting through various databases and archives and they've um, been investigating the published mapping and, and articles and public media that is available. So they, they really have been doing a lot of things in the background. And I think we mentioned earlier, or Don mentioned earlier, um, you know, they, the explosion happened, there was uh, work to secure the site, there was the investigation of the fire marshal's office, there was time then spent to remove the debris from the site. Um, there, there was a whole bunch of things happening. Um, and during that time, Golder was doing all this background work. Since that time, and now that we the site is cleared and, and open for sort of the next steps to start, um, you will see them move from sort of this information gathering and review, review phase into actual field work. And so, as I said, you'll see Golder um, on site this week, you'll see them starting to um, do some specific actions and activities that will be directly involved with determining the source of the gas um, and its potential pathways. And so that we are using safety as our number one sort of guiding priority as we work with Goldar to finalize their work plan and to review their work plan at every step. Um, so it, we are, you know, we're asking them to um, be very thoughtful and, and very certain at every step of the process. So uh, you'll see, um, you'll see things start to happen on site this week and you'll see much more activity and, um, you know, things like soil vapor and gas monitoring uh, will continue to happen. There will be, um, they will at some point uh, be doing some work on the actual surface of the ground and, and looking at um, this potential subsurface wells and vents that are there. Um, but again, I just want to, to be fair to the company who's been working really hard in the background and to all the, the officials that are working with them. Um, they, there has been a lot of work to get us to this stage and uh, uh, still a lot of work to come, obviously. Um, but we, we do appreciate all the work that Golder's doing to move through a work plan, which will uh, take us to the next steps. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to add Don back in. Um, so there's been a few comments and questions about increase in traffic and, and specifically a question that came in or um, that it, it appears that there's quite a few semi trucks that are ignoring the detour signs and, and residents are just wondering if there's something more the municipality could do to uh, provide assistance to uh, deter any of the semi trucks that are coming through. I see that you're indicating to have uh, Thomas join us for that uh, question. Thank you. Uh, so Thomas, I'll just reiterate, um, lots of uh, questions, and I know that you you did talk about the continued moderation of uh, traffic in the affected area, but this is specifically that people are concerned. We know that with it's the harvest season, that there's quite a few semi-trucks that are coming into the area and ignoring the detour signs. Is there anything the municipality could do or maybe reaching out to police services to help monitor uh, the uh, increased tra traffic that appears to be ignoring the detour signs? So thank you again for the question. Uh, so as far as the question regarding the uh, changes to signage, again, we're always monitoring, always looking to see uh, if we can improve that. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a reality that all of the signage we have within CK, people ignore it. Uh, what we can do in this case is that uh, I will speak with the uh, police chief in uh, John Ken Police Services and when we do see someone mm. ignoring that sign, uh, we will stop them and uh, remind them of their obligations, please, to, to follow the detour signs. That's the best we can do right now. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that's the issue. I, I would like to point out that uh, I think 95% of the vehicles are following the signs, but we always have that certain percentage that do not. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. 
I'm going to bring Jennifer back into the feed. And so uh, we have a question from Abe, and he's wanting to know, uh, what is Golder? Can you explain what it is, what they do, maybe a little bit of experience? Uh, sometimes we forget those that uh, aren't in the uh, realm of government sometimes uh, don't have the same uh, uh, knowledge about certain companies. So could you maybe give us a primer on what Golder is? Yeah, it, it's um, a great question and thanks for asking it. I uh, We continue to use this word Goldar and um, to be really clear, they are a third party consulting company. Uh, they are, um, it's an international company, so they work around the world, but they definitely have a strong Canadian presence. Uh, they do this kind of work on a regular basis. So they do um, environmental work and um, and work in the mining, the oil and gas, manufacturing and transportation fields um, fairly regularly. And as I said, they have a global footprint. And um, but we've we're lucky to have a um, you know a fairly strong group here in Ontario, and uh, we've been working closely with them. So you'll hear us refer to them as Goldar, but it's actually Goldar Associates. And uh, and again, they're a third party. Uh, consultants who who really provide the expertise uh, to both ourselves and the municipality to move you know through the steps of um, um, finding the source of the gas, determining the what the pathway is, and then as we've mentioned a few times, they will be providing us with options and recommendations around um, mitigation or remediation of that gas source. So they have been great to work with so far. We They have been on site, um, just so you know, they, they have a person there 24-7 at, at this point who is um, responsible for monitoring uh, gas levels. And so they've been uh, on site doing that. And then they, as I said, you'll see an increased presence of the Goldar staff uh, starting this week as their field work and their on site um, activity begins. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm going to uh, continue with you. Uh, so the communication team is always looking for feedback on how we can better communicate information to Wheatley. We, um, we have an amazing team up with our customer service trying to get information out, but we know we can always do a better job. So we ask our Wheatley citizens to reach out to us at 311 and let us know how we can do a better job. But since I have you with us, uh, and, and I hate to put you on the spot, but how is it, uh, how are you going to be able to disseminate information to keep the Wheatley residents updated as the progress uh, for you working with us in Golder? Uh, will that information, I guess, um, do you just want to uh, let us know uh, maybe the frequency of, of updates for the, the residents, to, uh, residents so we can uh, let them know what to be expected? Yeah, another great question. Um, so let me say this. The as I mentioned in one of my earlier responses, our initial focus was really on um, making, you know, getting our experts on site, stabilizing the site, uh, and starting to understand the pathways um, of and the source of that gas leak. Um, we've now turned our attention to what else does the community need. So, um, as we move forward, and and you know, as I've mentioned a few times, we are working very collaboratively with the municipality. We are, uh, I will say, in the last week or so, we've been thinking about what else do we need, what else uh, would be helpful from a provincial perspective to to support the. Um, to support you as residents and to make sure you're getting all the information that you need. Um, at this moment, I would say if you've got questions that are, are specific um, specific to some of the provincial services or things that we've talked about from a provincial perspective today, please do continue to send them through the municipality. We are working uh, collaboratively day to day um, and they can triage them over to us. Uh, I think that's the short term um, best case response. But again, we're working with Don and his team just to figure out if there's more needed uh, in terms of more regular provincial updates, then we will also look at uh, how we can best sort of fill that gap in, in terms of needs. So so stay tuned. And I guess the last part of the, the question maybe that I'll answer is, um, you know, how often or how frequently will we provide updates and will we communicate? I think we've committed, you know, both to the municipality and I think on the last call we had a few weeks ago, uh, my commitment to you was at every step of the process. So every time, you know, we get to a stage where we have new information, where we have something helpful that we can share, um, where we have a better sense of the timelines um, or other things that you should be thinking about or 
um, you know, any anything that that really we we need to share with you, we will do that at every step of the process. So we have our commitment to that, and we uh, the province, you know, is is fully at the table here to support all your needs, uh, and we'll continue to do that as we move through this emergency. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to bring April onto the feed with me. Um, so there's a few people that. Um, are wanting to know some additional information where they can maybe find some uh, medical assistance. And I know that earlier yourself and Don mentioned victim services, uh, but th for those that would like to speak to someone um, ab ab about the the situation that they're currently in, could you maybe speak to that again of the help that the municipality can maybe do in victim services to um, link them up with the appropriate services and people, please? Sure, thanks, Amy. Um, it's difficult to answer the question if we uh, cannot speak directly with the individual, but certainly what I would recommend uh, first stop would be a primary care practitioner, whether that is a family doctor or a nurse practitioner. Certainly they would have uh, all residents medical kind of history and background information. But what I will say is that our case managers um, are really, really good at connecting individuals with the programs and services that they need in our community. So if there's anyone that has some specific kind of health related questions uh, that are a bit more personal uh, in nature, what I would recommend is that they uh, call our case managers uh, certainly on, um, we've got case managers working specifically with the Wheatley crisis uh, case manager team that can answer those questions. Now, um, for that personal kind of information, I prefer individuals call uh, our office on Monday. We will open up those lines at 830. That number is 519-351. 8573. Um, we, we do have the, the resource center, 108 Talbot, but when we're starting to get into some, some more personal issues, some medical issues, I'd rather link uh, individuals directly up to one of our case managers. They'll do a bit of an assessment and then provide uh, individuals with some referrals uh, that will allow them to get access to uh, some specific help. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, April. I'll, I'll bring back uh, the CAO's office. Uh, so uh, quite a few people uh, are asking again about being able to get into uh, locations to obtain um, uh, computers, paperwork, uh, and things like that. And so I'm, I'm hoping we can have Don or maybe uh, Chief Case again talk about the process for people being able to get into locations within the evacuation zone. Okay. So thank you. Um, we recognize that people want to get back in, but the, you know, the, the way Chief Case has explained it is the gas doesn't necessarily stop for two or three hours for people to get access to their properties. Uh, every time we do an access, it's try, we try and do an assessment to determine the, uh, the importance of getting access to the pieces. And, and we have provided a few examples like people with uh, medical conditions or access to um, medications and so on. Uh, we would ask the people if it's a business owner that they work with economic development, uh, an assessment will be done. And if we can get you access to your building, we will do so. If it's a residence that people want to have access to, please work with April Reek Dyke's team, the case management workers. They'll work with fire services to determine uh, if we can provide access and when that could occur. Uh, but there has been several reports in the last 24 hours that people were told they could go into their residences, have three hours to you know, move things out and so on. That's simply not the case. Um, we can't guarantee the safety of the site for extended periods like that. There's no uh, guarantee that the gas will not come back in. Every time we have someone go into a facility, there has to be special precautions made and we have to have firefighters suit up and make sure there's additional monitoring. We will try and provide that access as soon as we can, but it is not the case that people have unlimited access. There has to be an independent assessment done every time. Thank you. Uh, Don, I'll stay with you for just a little bit. I know this is information you can provide. 
Um, so one person is just looking for the hours of the resource center. And so we will post that for uh, the residents that are online with us. Um, and one person was also getting a great uh, idea that uh, could we not post a schedule and weekly updates at the arena so that people can be updated. I'm just wondering if you could maybe speak to the multiple locations of where people can find the information uh, that's available to them, please. Or perhaps Kathy Hoffman might be able to address that for us. I know that there's uh, multiple locations. So first of all, everyone has access to uh, daily updates. Um, we've encouraged people to sign up for the updates if they call CK311 at chatham-kent.ca or if they call 311 or the Municipal Civic Center, we will add people to a, um, a daily distribution list and we'll make sure people have access that way. We are also posting information on the municipal website to, you know, we're trying to centralize things so that, um, you know, there's one source where you're going to get all of the daily updates. Those two sources are, are the primary ways that we'd ask you to get information. If you are already on um, working with our, one of our case managers, you can also check in with the case managers. The same thing would be true for business owners. You can check in with economic development if you have specific questions. But we'll try and chase, chase each of those down. Uh, we are also doing uh, updates with our uh, local media. If there's something that changes that's significant, we're trying to draw people's attention to it. Uh, but we, the commitment we're making for the, um, the residents and the business owners, please sign up for those regular updates. And we'll do a daily update, even if the message is as, sh as short as there's nothing new to report. But we'll try and make sure that you're getting the most up-to-date information possible. Um, we, we have heard from some people that they're still not getting information. Uh, we're on receive if there's any other ideas as to how we can do that. But we are trying to make sure that the information you get is consistent and it's up to date and it's timely. And uh, we're trying to, uh, you know, also at the same time prevent rumors from being circulated on social media and so on where the information may not be true or maybe uh, misleading for folks. So please, um, please identify one of those sites and we'll, we'll try and work with you to get the information you need. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, perhaps yourself or maybe uh, Chief Case can address this. I know we spoke about it briefly, but Tina is wondering, are there plans to evacuate more houses? So every day, Chief Case is, is going to come over, but every day there is an assessment done. Like we're, we're doing constant monitoring. If the conditions or risk change, then we will make sure that there's a, a change in the evacuation area. As Chief Case talked about a few minutes ago, the current situation, the site is stable. Uh, we're not saying it's safe, but it's stable and we'll continue to monitor. Um, if we start doing some different things on the site, like next in the next week, we would expect that, you know, Golder might be bringing some equipment onto the site. Some of that could be heavy equipment. Before they would determine what was going to be done, we'd do a safety assessment and determine whether there's any additional risk as a result of the activities. If there is, we'll notify people and we might expand the site. Uh, we've done some preliminary work on that to help people understand what would be needed. But we're not going to ask or displace more people unless there's an increase in the risk. And as soon as we can, and if the risk is decreased, we'll allow people to go back to their properties. But that's going to be occurring over the next several weeks as we do the assessments. Chief, anything to add? No. Done. Thank you. Amy, are there any additional questions? Thanks, Don. Um, just reviewing uh, the questions that were pre-submitted to make sure that they uh, had uh, all been addressed. Just uh, want to uh, reaffirm to the residents that we will continue to look at these questions uh, during the live event, and we will attempt to provide answers uh, going forward on them. Um, and I'm also just doing a quick monitor of the questions that have been posted online. I know that some of them we will be doing off um, offline from this event. Uh, we are nearing uh, almost uh, noon and so I do want to touch base with uh, Jennifer for uh, final comment as to the next steps coming up and then uh, Don will be coming back uh, uh, to, to your office uh, for final comments from the mayor please. Uh, Jennifer? Jennifer you appear to be muted so thank you. My apologies. Um, so thanks uh, again, Amy. And I want to thank you uh, for having me here again and for having our from all 
our full provincial team here as well. So, um, you know, we've got many people behind the scenes working on the response and uh, I'm I'm the face of that, but but please know that there are many provincial staff, including the, the folks who are on the line with me today and many others from their teams who are also working to support you. I, um, I appreciate getting the time to discuss all the different things that are going on with you. And I really do appreciate all the questions that have come in. It, it helps us uh, think about the things you're wondering about, the things you wanna know about. And we can obviously tailor future communications um, to the questions that have come in today that we, even the ones we haven't got to. I do wanna say, you know, and I think we've said this a few times, but I just wanna reiterate the public safety and the protection of your community is, uh, is currently and will remain our number one priority. So we will, we're here with you. We want to. I want to ensure that you know that we're committed to working collaboratively with the municipality, with all of you as residents. We do want to um, continue to support all the efforts, and uh, you know the province will be along with you until we see the end of this challenging situation that you're in. So, um, again, appreciate the time and um, and appreciate the municipality continuing to set up these types of events. Uh, the minister did make an announcement this morning regarding uh, the $2 million funding that um, has been announced for um, specifically to assist impacted businesses. And um, you'll see that the, the focus of that funding as we work closely to, with the municipality to be able to roll out the details of how businesses can apply and, and get access to that funding. But it really will really be focused on ensuring that businesses and services are able to continue to operate in the community of Wheatley, that they're continue to to be able to offer employment opportunities um, and that the we citizens of Wheatley do have the services and those um, local business supports that they need to continue to live in the community. So there, uh, you'll see more information coming out about that in the coming days ahead, um, but I think it's an exciting announcement and, uh, and I'm looking forward to having more of those as we, uh, as we continue to work with your municipality. So thanks again, Amy, and I look forward to talking again in the future. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to add Don back. Uh, just want to thank you for uh, being able to meet with us and assist us today. Um, I do have a, a couple more things for Don, um, but I do want to just thank uh, yourself, Jennifer, for being available. Ian, uh, you from the Municipal Service Office of Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Nelson from Social Assistance uh, Policy, or, and uh, Tim Beckett from the Ontario Fire uh, Marshal. We do appreciate your assistance. Uh, I do want to just... Uh, reach out to the residents and if they could let us know, do you find these Facebook Live uh, sessions with the ability to ask questions, do you find them uh, beneficial? And if you do, if you could just reach out to us either through 311 or by emailing us and just letting us know if you find this, um, uh, if this process um, has been beneficial for you. Um, so just coming back to you, Don, uh, so I'm unsure if you're able to provide uh, some clarification on two questions. I'm going to start with the first one. So the residents have been calling uh, Enbridge uh, service about, um, you know, shutting off uh, their service. And they've been told and advised they have to write a letter uh, to them. And the residents were wondering, could there be a more streamlined process where, for, for example, maybe somebody from the municipality or support group could speak to Enbridge on their behalf and advise of the situation and, and help them with that. So could you maybe just speak to that for us, please? Uh, so we're not in a position where we can speak for a resident. Uh, the, the contracted relationship between Enbridge and the, the property owner is uh, a direct one and the municipality, we, we certainly work with Enbridge and we can flag it for their, their folks so that they're sort of on receipt for the messaging, but we cannot go in and ask that a service be shut off uh, you know, short of having an emergency situation where uh, there's a, an immediate threat to, to the safety. But I think um, the information we have so far is that you have to contact Enbridge directly and ask for uh, a change in your service level. Thanks, Don. Um, and another question, uh, perhaps for yourself, but maybe also April, so we'll bring April back, is a couple people have asked, what about those that are uninsured? Uh, how might we be able to help them? Um, maybe April, you can uh, start, please. Sure, Amy. Uh, as I indicated, when we start uh, reaching back out to residents that have been evacuated, one of those initial questions we will be asking is, 
uh, do they have insurance? And I'm not going to get into the insurance piece. There's been lots of uh, discussion about that already. But for individuals who do not have insurance, we will then begin to look uh, at their current situation, what's happening, what are their needs, uh, are there access uh, to any uh, emergency assistance? Uh, do we need to have them fill out uh, application for the Wheatley disaster assistance uh, that uh, the group is, is dealing with all of the donations that have come in? Um, and I can't stress enough how every single household uh, is going to be different and will be treated as an individual household where, where we will really assess all of their needs. So um, we don't want people to leave this call thinking, oh my goodness, I don't have insurance, there's nothing I can do. Uh, we're we're going to be there to help people walk through that. So thanks, Amy. Thank you, April. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll then start to move over uh, back to the CAO's office and um, uh, have some uh, final comments. Uh, Don, I'll add you back to the feed for me, please. Thanks, Amy. T two things that I, I just saw we haven't addressed in some of the comments. First of all, there's been a couple of people that have, I think you're, there's a question about the sense of urgency and why are people not working 24 hours a day, seven days a week to try and get people back in. Um, uh, the information we've had from the technical experts and also Chief Case is it's not safe to work at night with the gas the way it is. It's a, um, there are some limitations on that front. So uh, I can tell you that the municipal team has not had a day off since uh, 16th of July on working on the event and we'll continue to do so. But the 24 seven is not something we anticipate going to take place. And, and that's for safety and safety reasons. Um, also had a number of comments from people wanting to post things at the arena. We will post things at the arena. That's certainly something we can do to try and help people be informed. Uh, I think the other place that we could be posting information is at the community hub at Talbot Street. Uh, but again, please, if you can sign up for that event, if you have access to, to the internet and an email service, we can do daily updates to everybody and we'll make sure that that information is uh, included, including responding to questions. Thank you very much. I really appreciate people coming in today and uh, asking the questions and uh, we are interested in knowing anything more we can do if there's unanswered needs, um, but we are trying to, you know, keep you safe and try and get you back into your homes as soon as we possibly can. I'll turn it over to the mayor for his closing comments. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, first off, I want to start with thanking everybody for joining us today. I want to thank the minister and everyone from the province uh, signing in and uh, spending their time, uh, but all the time they're putting into this. I want to reemphasize the importance of communication. That's the purpose of this meeting. That's the purpose of everything we're trying to do. It's critical that we have meetings like this. Even if it helps one person, we're going to keep doing these meetings. But we, the ideas that you present in this meeting and through everything else is critical. When I look at the, you know, we talk about the four-way stops and improve, improve uh, communication through posting things. That's how we learn about this. That's how we can get through this together. So we need to continue communicating. Again, a reminder everyone, if you want daily updates, call 311, you can sign up, get email updates every day from municipalities. So communication's key in this. The premier's visit this week was it was really good for Chatham Kent, for the community, and for this uh, the whole uh, crisis. The premier and minister was able to see firsthand the the devastation in Wheatley. They're able to hear the concerns from the residents, and you know, the since that point, the you know, the premier has reached out to me a number of times, and he's uh, certainly uh, he's fully engaged in making getting a resolution here. The solutions a group effort. The municipality officials will remain a key part of the effort to get residents through this crisis, but there's so many other parties, uh, residents, businesses, and individuals have stepped up big time in financial support and various things. You know, the, the Wheatley Action Committee and the BIA in Wheatley are forming a, a key piece to getting assistance through. However, the, the other, you know, the province as well, uh, we're relying significantly on the province and experts they have hired to find a source or remediate. Certainly the financial assistance and support they're providing is great as well. 
we're hopeful that the federal government can step into all this equation as well. We talked about that a bit at the meeting, but we're, we're hoping for that. Bottom line is we need to get through this together. We need to find a solution as soon as we possibly can to get residents back in their houses, uh, houses and businesses as fast as we can safely. So thank you everybody and we'll look forward to the next meeting.